All right, here we are. Uh, the book of Leviticus, Leviticus for Beginners, Training for Holiness is the subtitle. We're at uh, lesson number four, title of this lesson, Attaining Holiness, Grain and Peace Offerings. And we're going to be covering uh, chapter two and chapter three, all the way to verse uh, 17. So let's uh, briefly look at our outline for purpose of uh, review. Um, uh, first section uh, that uh, we are studying is the attaining of holiness, chapters 1 to 16. And the first subheading that we're uh, talking about is attaining holiness, how? Through offerings, chapters 1 to 7. What kind of offerings? Well, there were five different kind of offerings. The burnt offerings, what we talked about uh, previously. Uh, grain offerings and peace offerings, the subject of today's uh, class, this class. And we also noted that there were five types of offerings in all. And so that would include sin offerings and guilt offerings. Now I showed you that both the one making the offering and the priest that was presenting the offering to God, in other words, putting the offering on the, uh, on the altar, both of these individuals had a role to play and they had tasks to perform in order to make what was being offered acceptable before God or holy before God. The book of Leviticus is the manual or the book of instructions for the acceptable way of presenting offerings or keeping special days and festivals, uh, or maintaining one's personal state of holiness. And this was important for the following reason. Because in choosing the Israelites to be his people, God made one condition. And the condition was they were to be holy. Why? Because he was holy. He was a holy God and he was choosing them to be uh, his exclusive people, a holy nation. So if he was holy, they had to be holy as well. And so the book of Leviticus uh, contained the information and the instructions to both attain and maintain this holiness that is uh, spoken of. Something no other nation could aspire to, even if they desired it. Why? Because, well, first, they weren't chosen by God, and secondly, they didn't have this information. All right, so let's begin talking about the offerings themselves. And we're going to begin with the grain offering, chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. This is the second type of offering. It was the grain offering of wheat or barley. The uh, Hebrew term for this offering literally meant gift and was often used as a general term for offerings. However, it eventually came to be used as a term for the cereal or the meal offerings. The term suggested an offering of thanksgiving. And so the grain offering was like the burnt offering in that it was brought to the Lord, it was prepared by the offerer, and a portion was offered on the altar by the priest and the offering itself was pleasing to God. In other words, uh, the Bible uses the term a soothing aroma, meaning it was acceptable. They had done it in the correct way. However, it was different than the burnt offering in two ways. First of all, it did not result in the atonement of the offerer's sin. And the reason for that is no blood. A grain offering has no blood. And so any type of offering um, uh, whose outcome uh, would be the forgiveness of sin had to have a blood component. Why? Because life is in the blood, right? And so a life had to be offered in order to atone for sin. And so grain offerings did not um, uh, suit that purpose. Well, we're not designed for that purpose. And then secondly, only a small amount of grain was burned on the altar by the priest. The rest of the grain was given to the priest to, uh, for uh, a burnt sacrifice of an animal or the entire animal except the hide was burned to ashes. Nothing was left for the priest. So uh, in a grain offering, the priest put a portion of the grain on the, burnt, uh, on the altar of burnt offerings and kept a portion. When it was a burnt offering, like of an animal, the entire animal was placed on the, uh, on the altar. 
And so the chapter on grain offerings has three sections. First, rules about offering uncooked grain. Secondly, instructions about offering grain that has been cooked. And thirdly, instructions about how first fruit of the grain must be offered. So let's uh, begin talking about the, uh, let's begin by talking about the offering of uncooked grain. And uh, let's read a passage, uh, Leviticus chapter two. It says, now when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and shall take from it his handful of its fine flour and of its oil with all of its frankincense. And the priest shall offer it up in smoke as its memorial portion on the altar, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord by fire. So here we get details concerning the instructions. Grain offering was a voluntary gift to the Lord. We find out, first of all, it served as a less expensive burnt offering for the poor or those who, who farmed and did not own any uh, livestock. The, um, the grain offering was uh, enhanced by adding to the fine flour some olive oil and perfume. Here it says frankincense, which was expensive, making the grain offering something that cost the offerer you know, a considerable of, uh, amount of, uh, of money. Uh, in other words, uh, because they were offering a gr grain offering, it, it doesn't mean it was without cost to give. Just like the burnt offering of an animal cost you know, the price of the animal because they burned all of it up, a grain offering also cost something because the frankincense and the oil, those things were expensive, especially for those uh, who, were, who were poor. As always, uh, the priests placed the portion to be burned on the altar, and this portion was referred to as the memorial portion. Now, some scholars think that since this was a thanksgiving offering, the memorial portion referred to the original liberation of the Jews from Egyptian slavery by God's hand, and thus the offering, you know, the memorial idea was remembering that original freedom uh, that God had uh, obtained for his people. Now, since the grain offering was holy, the part left was given to the priests who were holy, and it was to be eaten at a holy place, and that meant in the tabernacle complex. The portion of the grain sacrifice eventually became an important source of support for the priests and their families that qualified, meaning they were clean. You had to be clean uh, in order to eat of the sacrifice, and later on we'll talk about clean and unclean, you know, those type of things, uh, and how to differentiate those. All right, so there were also instructions for those who offered grain that had been cooked in some way. For example, uh, had been baked in an oven or prepared on a griddle, something that was fried, or cooked in a pan. Offering the grain uncooked or cooked in various ways was left up to the one who was offering the, um, the grain sacrifice. Whether cooked or uncooked, three offerings, uh, these offerings rather, had four things in common. First of all, they were all to be made uh, uh, with fine flour. Secondly, all of them were to include oil in the mixture. Thirdly, a memorial portion was to be burned as a pleasing aroma or an acceptable aroma to the Lord, that, that, that it was being done in the way that the Lord had given and thus it was pleasing to him. And then fourth, the remainder of the grain or whatever, the baked goods uh, were given to the priest as a thing most holy. Now there were some special rules uh, for grain offerings and I wanna read about that in chapter two. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you shall bring them to the Lord, but they shall not ascend for a soothing aroma 
on the uh, altar. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, uh, you shall offer salt. Also, if you bring a grain offering of early ripened things to the Lord, you shall bring fresh heads of grain roasted in the fire, grits of new um, growth for the grain offering of your early ripened things. Two more verses. You shall then put oil on it and lay incense on it. It is a grain offering. The priest shall offer up in smoke its memorial portion, part of its grits and its oil with all its incense as an offering by fire to the Lord. So even though the offer had many options when bringing a grain offering, there were some limits. For example, grain offerings cooked in advance could not contain honey or leaven. And one reason for this was because pagan sacrifices often used these elements in their worship. And so uh, to make sure that there was a difference, a separation from the world and the things of the world, these instructions uh, were given to the Jews. Now, newly ripened grain or first fruits were not burned on the altar, but they were given to the priests, not uh, only as a token portion, uh, excuse me, only a token portion was burned after oil and incense were added to these. Every cooked grain offering had to contain salt, which symbolized the preservation of the covenant between God and his people. What was the covenant? I'm a holy God and you will be my people, therefore you will be holy. That's the covenant they're talking about here. Salt was used as a preservative, of course, for food in ancient cultures to prevent food from spoiling. And they represented a consistency, if you wish. So all the sacrifices needed to have salt as a uh, symbolism of the covenant, uh, the lasting covenant between uh, God and his people. The significance of grain offering um, uh, grain offering was uh, used primarily to uh, show gratitude for God's favors and to remain in a favorable relationship with him. Remember I said before, you couldn't use it as a sin offering because there was no blood involved, but it was used as a thank offering to say thank you to God for various favors or to, to remain in his favor. In Numbers 15, uh, you have instructions as to how much grain was to be offered along with an animal sacrifice, since grain offerings were rarely presented by themselves. It was usually accompanied by a drink offering when animals were offered. We find that out in rum, uh, Numbers, rather, chapter 15. So an animal was offered as, a, uh, as atonement uh, accompanied by a grain offering to also give thanks and appreciation and wine or water was poured out before the altar, not on the altar, but before the altar to signify honor and gratitude. Thus, a single sacrifice with various elements contained and conveyed several meanings and thoughts, acknowledgement of sin, repentance, thanksgiving, faith, praise, solidarity and uh, permanence, you know, the salt, permanence. So we need, to, we need to think about the sacrificial system as a whole in a particular way. We need to realize that the sacrificial system was a kind of spiritual language where the human person learned to communicate with God on God's terms, using a language given to sinful man by God uh, this language mediated by the priests, where the person was sure that what he wanted to say was heard and more importantly, accepted uh, by God. As I say, a single sacrifice uh, could be saying to God, uh, I repent, uh, please forgive my sins. Thank you for your uh, many blessings. I continue to believe in you. I praise you. I'm, I'm one with you and your people, O Lord. Uh, I trust in the permanence of our alliance. You know, it, it, it could say all these things with one, one sacrifice when done according to the uh, plan, according to the process that God had uh, given. 
The sacrificial system also presented every person, regardless of their wealth or position, an equal opportunity to come before God in a pleasing and acceptable manner, since it required the same thing from each person. Whether you're rich or poor, you had to go through the same procedure. Uh, for example, faith, sacrifice. I want you to get the context here. Whether you were rich or poor, all right, uh, your approach to God required the following things. Faith, for example, sacrifices were physical actions symbolizing unseen things which were accepted by faith. The acceptance of forgiveness for sins uh, passed on to an animal which was then burned by fire required faith if one was to experience relief and peace uh, once the sacrifice was offered. You know, I, I said to you in the previous lesson, uh, one transferred the sins from the physical realm to the spiritual realm through the death of the animal. Death was the portal from one you know, dimension to the other. But I mean, it required faith. You couldn't see that. It required faith to understand that that's what was taking place. It also required sacrifice. It wasn't any old animal. It wasn't to be sacrificed in any old way. It wasn't just some grain hauled in a sack. Whether it was an animal or farming produce, it had to be the best of what you had and it needed to be prepared for sacrifice in a very precise manner. Whether you were offering a bull or a lamb or a pigeon or grain from your fields, it cost you time and effort and a financial sacrifice to be able to come before God and make this sacrifice. I mean, compare Cain and Abel's sacrifices in, in Genesis chapter four, and you'll see why Abel's was accepted and Cain's was rejected. It wasn't because God liked animal sacrifices better than farm produce. After all, Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. They offered you know, what they had. But look at the real differences. In Genesis 4, 3, we read, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Now, what did Cain bring? It says here, he brought some of his produce. It doesn't qualify the produce in any way. It wasn't the first of his produce. It wasn't the best or the ripest of his produce, but it was some, a sample, a portion, nothing special. But then we read Genesis 4.4, 4, where they talk about Abel's sacrifice. It says, Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. So what did Abel bring? Well, he brought the firstlings, their fat portions of his flock. In other words, he offered uh, the firstborn of the flock, but also burned the best parts of the animal as far as eating and taste are concerned. He could have just killed the animal and put the head and the legs and the entrails and the liver and the stomach on the fire and offer that as a sacrifice and kept the edible parts for himself, but he put the best parts of the animal on the altar for God's portion. God didn't simply consider the value of what was on the altar, but the cost, the sacrifice required to make that particular offering by the individual. The, the acceptable offering pleasing to God was the one that left you poorer, the one that left you less wealthy because of what you had given. So the sacrificial system required the same things from each one who offered something, regardless of the type of sacrifice made. It required faith on your part that what was happening was going to you know, please God and be acceptable in his sight. And it required personal sacrifice. In other words, it had to cost you something. And then it also required piety. Piety is an attitude of respect and reverence, not only for God, but also for the things of God. 
And in this case, it was the instructions for the offerer in preparing and offering his sacrifice. A pious person respected the divine instructions because they were given by God. And as such, the instructions themselves were holy and they were rendered holy, meaning they were set apart uh, and set apart those who carefully obeyed and followed the commands. It wasn't just, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that. Man, he's making it complicated. No, it was, I'm happy to do things the way he's asked me to do them because I know that in doing this, I am pleasing God and that's what I want to do. A holy person, uh, his or her objective is to please God in all that they do. This is not legalism. Some people you know, say, oh, they're just legalists, you know, uh, interested only in detail. This is not legalism. You know, obedience to rules to, to make oneself acceptable to God. Pious men, pious women carefully followed God's instructions for offering sacrifices so that God would be pleased with the offering. They wanted to thank and to please God, not justify themselves. There's a big difference. All right, justifying yourself is, uh, okay, I've offered what I had to, I've, you know, I, 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 I ticked off all the boxes, I'm good to go. You know, it, 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 it's, it's following the rules, being careful to do the things, you know, in a godly way, simply to justify oneself. That's legalism. But when you're careful to follow God's instructions in all things and to preserve His instructions in all things, and you're doing it because you love Him, that's not legalism, that's holiness. There's the difference. So today's worship, for example, is no different in what it requires of the worshiper, even if the manner of worship is much different and the meaning has changed uh, you know, over the years. Worship still requires faith. In Hebrews 11 and 6 it says, and without faith it is impossible to please Him. Remember I said we do the things we do because we love God, we want to please Him, and the Hebrew writer says without faith you can't please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, right, He's there, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He's there, he's pleased with your sacrifice, your offering, and he will reward you for that. The second thing modern worship still requires is sacrifice. Second Corinthians 8.3, Paul says, for I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. He's talking about a church that went you know, beyond, the, beyond the pale to, to give and to help, uh, to help other, other, uh, other churches. In the same way uh, today, when we give uh, during the worship period, uh, I've, I've told our own congregation, it's got a pinch. It's got a pinch. If what you give makes absolutely no difference to your lifestyle, makes absolutely no difference to your purchase power, your purchasing power, makes absolutely no difference whatsoever, well then, you know, there's no sacrifice involved. It's just perfunctionary. You're paying your dues. Pleasing God requires sacrifice. It's got a pinch. And then thirdly, today's worship requires piety. First Timothy 2.8, therefore I want the men in every place, and we always concentrate on the men in every place, and that's true, that's fine, you know, male spiritual worship, I'm not discounting that. But I want to highlight something else here. It says, therefore, I want the men in every place to pray. And here's what I'm focusing on, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. You know, in those days, the Jews prayed you know, with their arms lifted up. We, some churches do that, some brethren do that. That's fine, I'm not, I'm not, you know, we're not debating that point. It's lifting up holy hands 
Not whether you lift your hands up or you clasp them this way, but are your hands holy? In other words, the things that you do, are they righteous, are they good? Are they holy, are they loving? Are they pure? Those are the type of hands, that's the type of life God wants us to offer as we offer our praise to Him. Piety, piety today is seen in the church's careful adherence to the instructions given to us in the New Testament about worship. As far as who does what, the things we do to worship God according to His instructions, and the proper demonstration of faith and sacrifice and piety in order to offer what is pleasing to God. Are we interested in offering what is pleasing to God or are we just interested in getting out on time? As people say today, just saying. <laughs> Are we interested in offering faith and sacrifice and piety, piety to God because He will be pleased with that? That's not legalism, that's love. It's the only way we can love uh, God. He's not a human being. We can't hug Him. We can't just smile at Him. He has His own way of receiving our love and this is the way He's told us to love Him. Let's talk a little bit about peace. I don't have any segue from what I've just said to the next type of offering, but let's talk about peace offerings here in Le Leviticus chapter three and, and seven. Uh, peace offerings, another type of offering from the Hebrew root word shalom, uh, which meant a whole slew of things, uh, health, prosperity, peace with God, salvation, wholeness. When you said shalom, you, know, you were offering all these things to someone else. Um, these were offerings, uh, the peace offerings, were those meant to strengthen this wholeness that an individual had, that the people of God were striving for. The instructions for the peace offering uh, were similar to those of the burnt offering, except the following. First of all, the animal sacrificed could be a male or a female, unlike the burnt offering, which, was, uh, which required only a male uh, animal. Another difference, <clears throat> only certain parts of the animal were sacrificed, in other words, were put on the altar, leaving the rest to be eaten mainly by the one offering the animal or shared with uh, family and friends. That's why it was sometimes referred to by different terms in different Bibles. Different Bibles calls the peace offering different things. For example, um, the New Revised Standard uh, Version uh, calls it a, a sacrifice of well-being. Uh, the New International Version calls it the fellowship offering. Uh, the Revised English Bible calls it a shared offering. The New Jerusalem Bible calls it a communion sacrifice. All different ways of saying you know, what we're talking about here, New American Standard Bible calls it a peace offering. The uh, burnt offering required the entire animal reduced to ashes, nothing left. Uh, but um, uh, the peace offering, however, uh, uh, allowed the individual uh, to offer parts of the animal, but also to keep uh, parts of the animal. Um, another difference, uh, three kinds of animals could be used, cattle, lambs, goats, male or female, without blemish, always. The primary goal was to share a meal so that the offering of birds or grain would not be sufficient for a peace offering. Um, Certain parts of each animal were always to be placed on the altar and to be burned. So let's read about that. That's an important point, chapter three. It says, now if his offering is a sacrifice of peace, all right, so here comes instructions about the peace offering. If he is going to offer out of the herd, whether male or female, he shall offer it without defect before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and slay it at the doorway of the tent of meeting and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood around uh, the uh, altar. Uh, from the sacrifice of the peace offerings, he shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. 
the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, which is on the loins and the lobe of the liver, which he shall remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's sons shall offer it up in smoke on the altar on the burnt offering, which is on the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. So in the description of the sacrifice of the lamb and the goat, the same parts are always mentioned. The fat covering the entrails, the two kidneys with the fat on them, the lobe of the liver with the fat, so on and so forth. Now some people believe that it was God's way of helping the Jews eat healthy and avoid fat. You know, and there's some truth to that. Another idea is that since fat was considered a delicacy, Offering the fatty portion was giving God a tithe of the animal, the best part right off the top in sacrifice. And the rest in most offerings, except for birth offerings, were shared by the priests and the worshiper. In other words, God was offered the first and best portion, and then the priest and the worshiper shared what was left. In verse 17a, God confirms that the Israelites were not to eat the blood of the sacrifice. And again, we say the life is in the blood, which belongs to God, or they were not to eat the fat of the sacrifice because this was his portion of the sacrifice. Uh, another point, uh, peace offerings were free will offerings, not required by God, Unlike burnt offerings, God required a burnt offering every morning and every night. A peace offering was a free will offering. You could offer it at any time. Uh, it was uh, an offering given by one with a generous heart, at peace with God, at peace with others and himself, wanting to maintain and strengthen his contentment and his relationship with God. Uh, another point, uh, chapter seven, describes three types of peace offerings. The first type is a thanksgiving offering, offering uh, an offering uh, given um, in thanks for uh, blessings. Many times a peace offering made, uh, was made when family uh, could eat a fellowship meal eaten in or near the sanctuary. So it was like an event. We would bring a peace offering, we would make the offering to the Lord and so on and so forth. And then they would eat the, uh, the, you know, the portion uh, that remained uh, in, in the tabernacle uh, complex or near it. Uh, the second type of peace offering was called a votive offering. This meant that when one had fulfilled a vow made to God, a peace offering was made to celebrate the completion of the commitment in a successful manner. So that was the votive offering. And then you had what was called a free will offering. This was made to give thanks for and to celebrate the fellowship enjoyed with others in the Lord. So you had the peace offering, it had different you know, reasons to give it, but it was always given uh, in the same way. Another point, Peace offerings were used to celebrate public occasions. We're going to talk about that you know, later on, the different festivals throughout the Jewish calendar. And when they did have these festivals, uh, the peace offerings were the type of offerings uh, that, were, uh, that were made. In 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, the Bible recounts how Solomon, uh, you know, at the inauguration of the temple, when it was finally finished and built, he offered 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep in peace offerings at the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. And I think it's worth reading about this. It says, now the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace, there's the peace offering, which he offered to the Lord 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. So the king and all, his son, and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house uh, of the Lord. On the same day, the king conse consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, because there he offered the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat of the peace offerings. 
for the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to hold the burnt offerings and the grain offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. So Solomon observed the feast at that time and all Israel with him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God for seven days and seven more days, even 14 days. On the eighth day, he sent the people away and they blessed the king. Then they went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David, his servant, and to Israel, uh, his uh, people. So this here, you know, in, in, in my humble opinion, uh, this was the highest point of Israel's history right here as the people of God united with their God and their human leader Solomon and each other as a united people made this fantastic uh, uh, offering uh, to the Lord, which took days and days of preparation uh, to, uh, to successfully offer all of these. This is, this is the high point, a high mark in the history of the uh, Jews. Uh, well, we no longer use animals today uh, in our pursuit of peace in the Christian age, but we still desire peace in areas of life because we want and we need peace with God, don't we? We can't be at peace or at ease inwardly unless we know that we're at peace with God, that He's not just waiting to judge and punish us. God knows this and he has secured on our behalf a peace for us with him that settles our minds and our hearts with a true and lasting peace. Also, in Romans chapter five, verse one, we read, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, our salvation, through Jesus Christ, not only brings us peace with God concerning our salvation, but it also maintains our peace of mind and, and spirit as we live in this turbulent world. So nothing new, right? Peace offerings were there to maintain and to celebrate the peace that the individuals had with God. Well, today in the same way, we need to have peace with God and Jesus' offering of himself as a sacrifice for our sins, this is what produces our peace. This is what maintains our peace. A lot of people say, boy, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm such a mess. I look back, I see all the sins that I've done. And, and I usually stop them at that point. And I say, okay, there's your problem. And they say, what's that? The sins that I've committed? No, no, your problem is you're looking back. Don't look back because What's in the back is failure and sinfulness. And of course, if you're a Christian, the cross of Christ and the sacrifice for your sins and your baptism that washed away your sins, you know? But I mean, you know, don't, don't look back because sin is back there, failure is back there. Look forward, look forward to uh, what God has uh, promised you. So we need peace with God. We also need peace with ourselves. Despite the anxiety and fear that is often experienced because we live in a, a sinful and a dark world, as believers, as sheep among wolves, as outsiders and pilgrims, never quite fitting in, always going against the grain, Jesus gives us a special kind of peace of mind. In Philippians chapter four, Paul writes, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace, there it is again, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace of mind is not based on logic or things that we can see. You know, well, let's see, I'm healthy, I've got a solid job, I've got a fat savings account, they can't fire me at work because I own the company, I've had a full life, blah, 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 therefore, you know, I'm really feeling good. That's, that's understanding, that's logic, that's, that's uh, peace based on what is tangible. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, that's just what that is, however. But God's peace is beyond understanding in that it is spiritual in nature. The peace that he gives is based on our access to him in prayer, guaranteed by our faith in Christ. 
I have peace because I know that I can go to God at any time and lay my, my sins, my problems, or my joys, I can lay them before Him and I know that He hears me. That brings a peace that's beyond understanding. Why? Because I don't exactly know, you know the physics or the metaphysics you know, operating that bring my prayers before uh, the God of the universe. I just know that they go before Him. By faith I know these things. And as a reward, God gives me a peace that surpasses uh, uh, understanding. What greater peace can one have than knowing that God hears and answers our prayers and this knowledge from above guards our hearts and our minds from the fear and anxiety produced by the people and situations and things from below. Because the guy who's basing his peace on the fact that there's a fat bank account and he's the boss of the company and, and he's got good health, all those things disappear in a, in a day, in a moment. In a moment, one day, whoops, you know, he's brushing his teeth and the blood is coming out. Uh, one day he has a heart attack. One day the stock market crashes. One day everything he was depending on no longer exists. It's all changed, it's all disappeared. W where does he find his peace at that moment? What Paul is saying here is nobody can take away our peace because no one can depose Jesus from his position in heaven. And no one can void the promise of God that he hears us when we call out to him through Jesus Christ. Who can be against us? Who can void the promises given to us uh, by God? This is the idea of a, a peace that surpasses uh, understanding. And then of course, we have peace with God, peace with ourselves, peace with others. When we are at peace with God and ourselves, we can have peace with non-believers because we can deal with them on the basis of love as Christ has dealt with us. And we also have peace with believers because we share Christ's love with them in the fellowship of the saints. We have peace with all of those. We have the, we have the way to have peace with all of those uh, around us because God has given us this peace. What does Jesus say in John 13, 35? By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another, it's good to know the doctrine, brethren, but when the doctrine is being uh, interpreted and implemented in the right way, the result will be if you have love for one another. That's the result, that we have the correct understanding uh, of, of the doctrine. All right, well, there's some information, hopefully, maybe not all for sure, but some information on the uh, peace offerings and the grain offerings. We're going to continue uh, with our uh, study of Leviticus. Uh, again, you may have read these chapters already, so I'm, I'm saying to you, go ahead and read them over again, because as you see, I, I don't read every single verse of the material that we're covering, and if you read ahead of time, uh, it'll just make more sense as we uh, go through this. Thank you for your attention. God bless you. We'll see you next time.